That's it? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we cannot imagine a better ending for today and also a better bridge, uh, let's say, for tomorrow's conversation than precisely Anjuli Fatima Ratha Kolb. If uh, this morning we were uh, talking with uh, Michael Wolf and with Panayota Kotsila about borders, about mosquitoes, about uh, the definition of certain words or concepts like invasive, native, or what could be considered as a menace, uh, and we continued that precisely with Tommaso De Luca and Francesco Urbano Ragazzi, and even with the screening of the video or the film of Ira Sachs uh, about what could be considered even domesticity, what could be considered normal, or what could be considered non-normative. I think that uh, the work precisely of Anjuli really deals with the words and with the powerful and abrasive capacity of words and how words are actually not only shaping our world, but how the world is also shaping words in, in return. Uh, let me introduce you briefly. Anjuli uh, is Associate Professor of English at the University of Toronto, where she teaches poetry and post-colonial literature and theory. Her academic research explores how science, medicine, natural history, and all the kinds of colonial knowing reshape literature, culture, economy, and politics. Her, her first book, Epidemic Empire, a fantastic, incredible uh, uh, book, uncovers the history behind the dead metaphor of the terrorism epidemic. Cole's poems, translations, and essays have appeared in various venues and are in conversation with the traditions of Urdu poetry, contemporary queer poetics, and a lyric memoir. So please join me welcoming Anjuli. Thank you. Slide, please. Um, they can change out their laundry or whatever. And then when they're done, it's closed, it's relatched. And then we can go ahead and we can remove whatever they place in there. Too.
clip you just heard is a sound recording from Guantanamo Bay. I'll say more about it in a second. Um, before I start, though, I want to suggest that at the end of a long day, um, this is a really good talk to close your eyes or move around or lay on the floor. It is hard to be in a chair all day, especially for us queers, so if you want to move, do that. There's not a lot of um, visual audio interaction that requires you to, everybody's so still. The other thing um, is that in Urdu poetry, we say va when people say something that we like. So if you feel like being noisy, that would also be wonderful. I doubt that's gonna happen, but you can feel welcome. Thank you so much to Ivan, Andrea, Matt, and to all the other people gathered in this assembly. As I said, the, field you, the clip you just heard is a field recording, and I wanna ask three pointed questions about it. What does the death rattle of an ailing empire sound like? What contours of space, what concept of distance does it suggest? How can we sketch the black site, the black box, the interrogation chamber, the vulnerable body in it from the acoustic dimensions of silence, of poetry, of drawings made from violated memory? Slide, please. Oh, that looks different, interesting. Slide, please. The ambient sounds at Gitmo are as recognizable as blacked out lines of a redacted poem. This is a sentence from Canadian poet Jordan Scott's essay, Lanterns at Guantanamo, and the field recording you heard was made by Scott and Jason Starnes at Guantanamo Bay in 2017. Today I'm going to talk primarily about my first book, Epidemic Empire, published in February by the University of Chicago Press. In it, I study the overlapping discursive, literary, political, and medical histories that have made the notion of an epidemic of terrorism a defining strain of common sense in the 21st century. I've come to think of the work that I'm doing in the book as a deep dive into a shallow metaphor. This phrase and its metaphorical elaborations, terrorism epidemic, epidemic of terror, have defined contemporary Islamophobia. Islam and Islamism are said to be, quote, a cancer on the human condition, a plague on reason and progress, embedded and insidious retroviruses, ideological contagions. Although I began the book long before COVID-19, our moment has had, as you can guess, no shortage of intersections with the research that I did. For this audience, I don't think I need to begin by elaborating the consequences of pathologized xenophobia and anti-Islamism. I'm also not gonna summarize the book this evening, but if you're interested in hearing a summary, there are a few previous talks up on YouTube. Instead, I'm gonna share a selection of readings, mostly from my own work, including an excerpt from chapter seven of Epidemic Empire, which largely discusses the 9-11 Commission report as a literary work of false non-redaction, the Senate Intelligence Committee report on torture as a work of performative redaction, and the revolutionary possibilities opened up by Solmaz Sharif's experiments with redaction. But I'm gonna begin with a poem written last summer during the intense waves of protests in New York, a season that has returned to us over the last months in many forms, temperate breezes and intemperate political murder. This poem, it, it's my poem, is also indebted to the work of Mary Austin and Fred Moten. While my academic work is largely about the negative consequences of what I call the disease poetics of empire, I also write in other places and other modes about the affiliative possibility of shared states of suffering and vulnerability and the desire for and necessity of both intimacy and mass action. This is called Summer. I, just, just again, in case anybody feels like now taking me up on it. Move if you'd like to. Summer. Everyone hears sirens in the shower when it hits the backed up tub water, but this is not amazing. We hear sirens in the hum of the fan, sirens in our bike gears, sirens in our girlfriend's sleep talk, and none of it is there. When we open the bathroom door, the chopper sound is loud and real, and this does not amaze us. It's in our ears and out of them. The smell of lilacs and lindens is also in our masks and out of them. A cloud we ride through in the haze of red and blue blinking and amazing. In Columbus Circle, a couple reads out the same story everyone just checked, Bronx crew setting, heading south on 6th. The whole city follows, us, follows each other through streets and over bridges, up to barricades and around them, jumps the barrier and climbs the median, follows the surfers at the paddle out, the crests of our movement making the Atlantic black again, remembering songs as foam caps on waves because they are good for us. In wetsuits, everyone's taking on the tide. The NYPD patrol boat smears past the breakers. In Ghana, everyone's paddling out, and the ocean swells them here and swells them there, and our hearts rise up with the swell. In Bristol, everyone pulled down Edward Colston, rolled him down the street, and you could hear his hollow clanging, burning a hole in history. A plastic matrix the ballad shape, takes shape in, and they dumped his ass in the river, and it was so amazing. 
In Minneapolis, everyone vowed to take apart the police and fill out the ear, even as our souls fill. And in Midtown, the streams of real estate fountains rose and fell. And the streets were so empty, we rode for miles in the middle of the avenues and stood on the pedals. Balance beamed the crossbar, and the distance heard no peace. New rhythms born of motor impulses, the sunset over the river was so amazing, peaching its invocations, intoning the center of experience, and breathing with us as we rode. Madison Square Park was breaking up and the surveillance floods were out on Morningside and Union Square was getting started and Barclays was a dance party and Harlem was thrumming on the sidewalk listening to pop smoke and trading city bikes for the rest of the ride home and Times Square was blocked off and Foley was full and the Tweed Courthouse steps were paid for the by the people and Gracie was blocked to 86th and Red Hook was fire and we were everywhere, swelling and rising, rhythm factoring, thought formation, paddling out, pedaling hard and blocking cars and when the bus driver laid on the horn and put up a fist and even a little smile, it was amazing. And Washington Square, a couple was all over each other, and a huge euphonium played crazy in love. And a man in a gold suit said everyone's outfit was amazing. On Friday for the Wear Your Best Walk, Jerome's on 96 handed out white roses, and we interrupted our good phone calls to tell a beautiful boy in a wax cloth gown, you look amazing. On Central Park West, long after curfew, a woman was being photographed for her sorority's graduation, and the photographer told her she looked amazing from behind the tripod, and to lean her head forward a little bit, a little more aggressive, and make the Deltas proud. Last Pride, no one knew each other yet, our girlfriends remind us, and this we think is amazing, because on 5th and 33rd, we see a couple depleting each other's faces, their masks dangling from their wrists like they had been waiting for it their whole lives. In a downpour, we prayed on the steps of St. John the Divine, handed out candles and lit them. As sirens arrived at Sinai, and we're all depleting each other's faces and feeding the block like we've been waiting for it our whole lives. Two blocks down from cute tunes, the Empire State Building is boarded up. The clouds are darkening, filling with a crackling rain, preparing us for being lost, the condition of moving in threes and fours. The bike kids are teaching us how to pop wheelies, but we're not brave enough, and one of them grabs us a papaya dog. And in 21 years in New York, we realize we've never had a papaya dog, and bitches, it's amazing. The Fanta is fast and the straw is wide, and neon sugar bounces off the walls and up the edges of the sky. Another kid, maybe 20, sees us eating the dog on the steps of the grad center and says, big dog, big dog, I got it, come ride it, which is the least amazing thing that has happened all week. And we're fond of him and full already, a stomach ache is coming on her, it's the chains around our waists. So fast and hard we might throw up on the steps of the grad center again, which is also boarded up, and shit, that is amazing, things we never thought we'd see are happening every day. In the sky, five choppers and suppositions that the commissioner is resigning. Is this terrible or amazing? The mayor says he'll cut the force, and in Houston, cowboys rode out like kings two days before a constable clotheslined himself on a traffic light, his horse running loose instead of charging protesters in London. No one can read more than text, and no one is sleeping long enough to think. But what we can do is feel our way toward the condition we call well-being, assimilate to the perceptible evidence of an allness. In Boston, our friends are silent, silent, and the ones in Mexico City say all the right things. Every New Yorker has wanted the city for herself. We dream it like clockwork. We dream it as much as we dream the undiscovered second apartment inside our rent-stabilized apartment. When we get home, our girlfriends have prepared dinners and waited for us to eat them, though we had the papaya dog, okay, two papaya dogs, and we're very late, hungry beyond what we thought was possible, and we eat so much. It's amazing. The city wants to live, our masks dampen in the June gloom and bellow into our mouths as we shout, the smell of the crowd becoming a good smell to us. We breathe long in the absence of cars, of work, different sirens scream all night. We scream until we're hoarse and everyone we know sounds insane. Minus skate clusters, the road is clear and we ride for miles without stopping. Our riding changes our strength, wheels out laughter. We are so much more to ourselves as friends to our friends. The days can't touch us, sigh and siren. Emergency call and responding, chopper messing the overhead, mosquitoes coming for our sweaty necks. The streets aren't ours, but they almost could be. We're endless, giving up our plans of single being. We call this instinct in others, in ourselves, inspiration. The Scott essay I began with was published a couple of months ago in a magazine called Manifold. It is largely about the experience of being granted partial access, the first poet, as far as he knows, to conduct research and write at Guantanamo as part of a media tour. His research was to be around the pathologization of disfluency under conditions of interrogation. Scott speaks with a stutter and has written about it in various places, including his children's book, I Talk Like a River. Here is what he observes, beginning with a citation from David Matsumoto in the FBI Law Enforcement Bulletin. This is Matsumoto. Increased speech disfluencies are associated with or caused by conflicts. As an interrogator, you can use the subject's speech patterns to cut through irrelevant and deceptive information and get to the truth of a crime or incident. Disfluencies are then considered 
most of the time, to be false and should be seized upon by the well-trained interrogator. Here's Scott, still the citation. The procedures of interrogation are based on fictions such as the listener and unified speech flow, fictions that produce a distorted idea of the complex and multifaceted process of active speech communication. And yet interrogation willfully operates within this fiction of clarity and threat from disfluency, a fiction that threatens disdain and violence upon the disfluent and forces utterance to propitiate the regime of fluency. Nowhere is this regime of fluency more searingly evident than in the records of enhanced interrogation which took place at Guantanamo Bay. The nature of interrogated disfluent speech is of questioning as forcible intrusion where the entire utterance is constructed in anticipation of encountering a response. At Gitmo, I hope to find evidence of the intimate and personal desires behind these forceful intrusions, as well as the nation state's desire for acquiring information from captive bodies that have no choice but to confirm preconceived narratives. Under interrogation, utterance is the imposition of predetermined state narrative upon the cracks of the disfluent. Confessed sentences expand through an excess of subordination and confession to become what Bakhtin calls a national language embodied in individual form. But what kind of speech is this? What kind of truth? Gitmo is where national language is dug up from mouths as treasure troves, a place where voice is redacted, slide please, as actionable intelligence, where imminent threat forms all breath lines. Gitmo, I thought, must be a place of profound disfluency. These thoughts wheel out beautifully from the work I did at the very end of Epidemic Empire on pathologization and the captive vulnerable body under epidemiological surveillance. The way that the status of vulnerability is co-opted by the state even as it exercises maximum violence on those already the most vulnerable. Scott's essay brings me back with a new sense of dimension and rhythm to the pages that I'm gonna share with you in a moment. This essay also captures, for me, new ways of listening to silence, a species of redaction, and a prompt to read closely, but in a different vein, to attend to gaps and fissures as spaces of plenitude. Ilya Kaminsky has written about the revolutionary possibilities of a testimony of silence in his Deaf Republic, a book about vulnerability and radical politics that you absolutely have to read if you haven't already. This is Alfonso Stands Answerable. Alfonso Stands Answerable. My people, you were really something fucking fine on the morning of first arrests. Our men, once frightened, bound to their beds, now stand up like human masts. Deafness passes through us like a police whistle. Here then, I testify. Each of us comes home, shouts at a wall, at a stove, at a refrigerator, at himself. Forgive me, I was not honest with you, life. To you I stand answerable. I run, etc., with my legs and my hands, etc. I run down Vasenka Street, etc. Whoever listens, thank you for the feather on my tongue. Thank you for our argument that ends. Thank you for deafness, Lord, such a fire from a match you never lit. Okay, I'm shifting now to excerpts from Epidemic Empire, which I think are from pages like 267 to 287, if anybody feels like looking at it at some point. And I will try to remember to show you a couple of images as I read. Again, an invitation to move your body if you feel like you need to. Um, read aloud time. The 9-11 Commission report begins, like any cosmopolitan pastoral, with the weather. With a constellation of placid and ordinary sights, with everyday people waking up and moving into the world, quote, Tuesday, September 11, 2001, dawned temperate and nearly cloudless in the eastern United States. Millions of men and women readied themselves for work. Some made their way to the Twin Towers, the signature structures of the World Trade Center complex in New York City. Others went to Arlington, Virginia, to the Pentagon. Across the Potomac River, the United States Congress was back in session. At the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, people began to line up for a White House tour. In Sarasota, Florida, President George W. Bush went for an early morning run." End quote. This distant high altitude opening conjures the pulse of American normalcy and graceful scene shifts from New York to Virginia, DC to Sarasota, with the busy pace of a shared endeavor unfolding to the industrious rhythm of an American president out for his morning jog. The text's conjured air grows heavier and more silken as the narrative moves south to the capital and further south to the Gulf. The proper names are familiar, steady, comforting. In the Potomac, we hear the echo of George Washington's crossing. In Arlington, the glory of fallen soldiers. In and as her millions, America woke, went to work, paid homage to democracy, attended to her fitness. 
Replete with sweeping meanwhile gestures, one sees immediately what Benedict Anderson means by the imagined community, brought into being once again in print. It is a masterpiece of patriotism, ekphrastic and lyrical, shimmering with idealism and ideology. The image it presents is that of a healthy nation. For a government document, the 9-11 Commission report expresses an almost unsettling profundity and warmth, couched in a marked writerliness, especially around the edges of the chapters. In the preface, Tom Keane and Lee Hamilton, chair and vice chair of the commission, express their gratitude to their fellow commissioners and their, quote, great affection for them. An odd sentiment that marks the report not only as a record of human trauma and detection, but of an unexpectedly optimistic national reimagining. According to the logic laid out in the narrative, Islam, in contrast to the anti-colonial grievances that fed what the report calls the overwhelmingly secular struggles for independence after World War I, fills in the blank space of a remote, terrifying, diseased, and impoverished place, the distant country from which the threat issues with maladies both social and economic. This characterization of the Islamic world further implies that the lack of secular democratic structures leaves people in the Muslim world more susceptible or vulnerable to the kinds of ideology with which, quote, Americans cannot bargain or negotiate. Namely, radical Islam's lack of respect for life, which the commissioners suggest, quote, can only be destroyed or isolated as if by inoculation or quarantine. What festers over there such narratives, worn, can be here in an instant. It's important to note that these rhetorical features are not present in the majority of bureaucratic and government writing about the events leading up to or resulting from the attacks on 9-11. The Senate Intelligence Committee report on torture goes to great pains, for example, to both undermine these rhetorical devices and, I argue, reveal their obscurantism in both dispositional and narrative terms. A rare document of its kind to receive such an accolade, the 9-11 Commission Report was nominated for a National Book Award for nonfiction in 2004. It sold more than two million copies in the first year and was downloaded nearly seven million times. The report's epidemic approach, though it is subtle and attenuated, becomes clear in its closing sections, where the logic of disease and cure asserts itself in force. Filtered in a homeoletic chapter through a section called simply imagination, the disease metaphor emerges as a considered and hindsight-informed model of intelligence, security, and management. The commissioners cite the failure of data sharing between intelligence agencies, broken information handoffs, and ineffective operations as key factors in the failure to prevent the terrorist attacks of September 11th. They then step back further into the metaphorical or imaginative, they become weirdly obsessed with the imaginative in this section. They're like, everybody should be a literature major. Um, everybody should not be a literature major. They then step back further into the metaphorical or imaginative space that the text insists again and again is the key to both understanding the past and to forestalling future catastrophes. Quote, however the specific problems are labeled, we believe they are symptoms of the government's broader inability to adapt how it manages problems to the new challenges of the 21st century. The agencies are like a set of physicians, set of specialists in a hospital, each ordering tests, looking for symptoms, and prescribing medications. What is missing is the attending physician who makes sure they work as a team." End quote. Calling back to Michel Foucault's account in The Birth of the Clinic, we see in this moment an imaginative attempt to pull back, to access and synthesize the multiple or synoptic gaze that's required to parse epidemics, quote, special, accidental, and unexpected qualities. The diagnostic scene in the 9-11 Commission report works in at least two ways. First, it identifies the bureaucratic systems of American intelligence and national security as subject to the kinds of bodily failures and vulnerabilities that result in symptoms. Here, the mechanisms of coordination that have broken down are understood as a failure of a natural system, one that has evolved in accordance with the blueprint of a successfully functioning body. The government's broader inability to adapt how it manages problems to the new challenges of the 21st century is thus cast as a malfunction in the putative metabolic perfection and perfectibility of the government's organ systems. At the same time, the problem is externalized as one of adaptability suggesting that the system's inadequacy is not one of conception or design, but rather of some unaccountable incursion from without. One wonders where the borders of the hospital are, what becomes of the sick who are not admitted. State history doesn't often make itself so imaginative and appealing. For a casual reader, the most striking difference between the 9-11 Commission report and the Senate Intelligence Committee report on torture published by the small literary press Melville House in 2014 is the omnipresence in the ladder of censor bars. Slide, please. The notes in particular illustrate this difference in disclosure. Actually, next slide, please. 
I might ask you to back up at some point. The notes in particular illustrate this difference in disclosure in urgently visual terms. The pages, as you can see, bedecked or marred, depending on the reader's dis disposition, with smooth black secrets of geometric regularity. These sensor bars stand as assurances that someone somewhere is taking American safety very seriously, or alternatively, that the CIA officers who have com committed torture and the intelligence agents, career bureaucrats, and elected officials who knew about it are working scrupulously to protect themselves. Names, dates, locations, and case file numbers that might bear such identifying information are largely blacked out, as you can see in the text. In contrast to the 9-11 report, where classification and clearance determined the commissioner's access to data, and a pervasive sense of secrecy and security shaped the narrative behind the scenes in ways that were largely inapparent to the lay reader, the Senate report on torture makes much of what is not showing visible. The cover of the first-run paperback is also black setting a markedly different tone from the patriotic red, white, and blue of the 9-11 report, which was sold at the accessible price point of $10 a copy. In 2006, the esteemed publisher, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux published a graphic adaptation of the 9-11 Commission report by comic book veterans Sid Jacobson and Ernie Colon. No such marketing schemes or kid-friendly adaptations accompanied the Senate Intelligence Committee report on torture, despite their similarly violent and disturbing subject matter. In almost every way, the Senate report on torture is a radically different record of the period of American history during the first decade of the War on Terror. It is largely free of rhetorical flourishes and novelistic frameworks. There are no cliffhangers or evocative section headings, no pastorals or set pieces. Little attention is paid to painting a picture of the enemy who in any case is ourselves or those acting on behalf of our government. The chapter titles of the executive summary exhibit neither clues nor artistry background on the committee study and overall history and operation of the CIA's detention and interrogation programs are exemplary of the document's tone. Compare these to the 9-11 report, we have some planes, and the system was blinking red. There is no palette of Orientalist tropes to draw on, and the text largely eschews characters, motives, and sweeping cultural histories. In keeping with the prose, the report on torture's visual performance is one of sobriety, shame, collective guilt, and admission of a systematic violation of the Constitution's core principles of due process and international law. It gives shape, color, and heft to the decade's national unknowing, to a sense of crescendoing ignorance, to a losing war. Even as it attempts to shed light on the horrifically extensive use of torture, and the enhanced interrogation, the report presents itself as a tissue of only partial information, pointing insistently in both its visual dimensions and its rhetoric to that which it does and cannot reveal. I'm interested in the contrasting literary and cultural effects of these two signal documents of the war on terror. I'm particularly interested in how opacity functions in the latter as a corrective to the tone of unanimity and transparency, scientism, if you will, in the former. In the context of the ascendancy of epidemiological approaches to terrorism, we must ask to what extent the visual impact of redaction tropes on the black boxed infection sites of 19th century cartographies of disease. Slide, please. If the medical, this is just some cholera cases from London um, in, I think, 1831. Um, very typical kind of arrangement of a disease map. If the medical fantasy of the 9-11 Commission report sustains a faith in the possibility of opening up, reading, understanding the motives and organization of contemporary Islamist terrorism, if it holds out belief in finding what the commissioners call a cure from within and instantiates a torture-based practice for the extraction of information through interrogation, the report on torture locates such sites of infection firmly within the mechanisms of American intelligence read not just as the record of an investigation, but also as a theory of information, even of representation. We often see the phrase, the CIA representation is inaccurate in the report. The Senate report on torture highlights the relationship in the 9-11 Commission report between positivism and imperialist chauvinism. I want to hazard that the story told by the second of these twin tomes of the terrorism decades is a direct result of the first. Where the 9-11 Commission report novelizes and medicalizes the war on terror, the Senate report on torture interrogates the consequences of this way of thinking and brings American wrongdoing into sharp relief with a supporting cast of nefarious CIA doctors. 
These doctors were also just authorizing like further and further use. But yeah, everybody, I think, in this room already knows this. So the medicalization of torture um, also appears in this document. And so doing the report on torture also subtly recasts its own revelations as proleptic causes for the widespread hatred of American imperialism. Recall not just the arming and training of Afghani jihadis during the Cold War, but also the unconscionable use of the sham hepatitis B vaccination campaign in the capture and killing of Osama bin Laden in Pakistan in 2011. Behind the black boxes of the redaction bars, the report on torture thus reveals the symmetry of American motives and crimes to the putatively veiled and obscure, the ontologically, culturally, and ethically incommensurable motives of the terrorist. The black box of Muslim, or Islamic, or Islamist, or jihadi subjectivity appears transfigured in the black boxes that obstruct a vision of what happens inside a detention cell, inside Guantanamo, at innumerable other black sites. This effect, of course, is not limited to the Senate Intelligence Committee report on torture. The aesthetics of redaction are an inescapable, could you back up two slides, please? Inescapable and visually powerful feature of so many documents provided in response to the Freedom of Information Act requests. Pages like this one, if you can't read it from where you're sitting, everything on the page is re redacted except the words waterboard. Pages like this one stand as perverse visual jokes and efforts to bring CIA detainees some measure of justice, even humanity. Slide, please. And then one more. Yeah. Thank you. Contemporary writers from the Islamic world have responded to the dominant iconography of the Muslim subject as commensurate with the literal black box of downed or hijacked airliners and the ontological black box of the impenetrable oriental other, veiled or otherwise in a variety of ways. In the Satanic Verses, a book that I write about, the only Rushdie book I like, Salman Rushdie revisits the archetypal black box of Islam, the Kaaba, recasting it as a site not of swarming obscurity, a cube of horrific secrecy, but as a busy locus of theistic agonism. He begins at the dawn of Islam in an Arabian Nights-esque vein with shades of Joyce's carnival. Quote, Jehiliya today is all perfume. The scents of Araby, of Arabia odifera hang in the air, balsam, kasha, cinnamon, frankincense, myrrh. The pilgrims arriving in Jahiliya navigate a town organized in a, quote, series of rough circles, houses spreading outwards from the house of Blackstone. The house will soon be adorned with the seven best verses composed at the annual poetry competition, nailed up on the walls like so many Lutheran theses. Rushdie adorns and fills the Kaaba, not just with verses, but also with conflicting beliefs and political arguments. Inside this structure and all around it is the statuary of various gods and goddesses, a glut of gods, a stone flood to feed the glutton hunger of the pilgrims to quench their unholy thirst. The idols too are delegates to a kind of international fair, he writes. Here we are given a picture of Islam's origins, blasphemous to be sure, in which migrancy, multiplicity, and syncretism take the place of an austere and mysterious fundament. Orthodoxy, in typically Rushdian fashion, is made heterodox in the shadow of the sacred cube. In place of monstrous obscurity, the vanishing point for a globe of Mecca facing Muslims, Rushdi's Kaaba is infused with prismatic light, becoming a kind of terrestrial sun. Quote, they say in Jahiliya that this valley is the navel of the earth, that the planet, when it was being made, went spinning around this point. Adam came here and saw a miracle, four emerald pillar pillars bearing aloft a giant glowing ruby, and beneath this canopy, a huge white stone, also glowing with its own light like a vision of his soul. He built strong walls around the vision to bind it forever to earth. This was the first house. It was rebuilt many times, one by Ibrahim after Hagar and Ismail's angel-assisted survival, and gradually the countless touchings of the white stones by the pilgrims of the centuries darkened its color to black. Then the time of the idols began. By the time of Mahun, 361 stone gods clustered around God's own stone." End quote. The feminist revision enacted in this passage compounds architectural palimpsesting, the history of structures and institutions fallen and rebuilt, with a history of touch. In keeping with the novel's reparative plots of shared sickness and shared apotheosis, the Kaaba's darkness is recuperated as evidence of rapt generations of a devoted people, a collective love expressed in contagion or co-touching. Returning to the birth of Islam is for Rushdie also a way of rewriting the political promise of the Iranian revolution. In this earlier, more open, less written temporality, he imagines the shift to Mahun's monotheism as both a scriptural site of errancy. Uh, I've really lost my place. And as a revolution of water carriers, immigrants, and slaves. 
Whether we understand these revisions as acts of devotion or as textual crimes against the God-given origin stories of the Prophet, Rushdie's efforts to populate Islam's most sacred site with the banalities of everyday life registers one attempt to challenge the received wisdom in the West of Islam as a cultural and epistemological black box. The Iranian-American poet Salma Sharif has taken up the contemporary resonances of this inherited tropology in more direct ways. In her 2016 collection, Look, uh, she derives a conceptual vocabulary from the 2007 edition of the United States Department of Defense Dictionary of Military and Associated Terms. In her serial poem, Reaching Guantanamo, Sharif shifts from a method of exposing the violent language of the state to an examination of the suppression and erasure of language as another form of violence, of systematic deontology. The poem comprises seven letters written by an unnamed wife to her husband, Salim. The poem's title, Reaching Guantanamo, speaks to a hopeful gesture, an attempt to touch, a hand held out, and also to the impossibility of literary arrival under conditions of extreme surveillance, abuse, and isolation. The sixth letter in the series elaborates such an, actuar such an actuarial approach to the lives of the detained or the otherwise abandoned, and demonstrates the thoroughgoing failures of an attempt at accountability. There's white space in these poems. I will treat it as silence. Dear Salim, the neighbors got an apology and a few thousand dollars. They calculate based on and age the worth of a, of a human. Hands shook as she opened. She took it out front and ripped it a little pile and set fire to it right there, right in front of. Says they'll send me a check for. I would. Never yours. At the level of the narrative, this penultimate letter in the series rages against the inadequacy of a bureaucratic response to wrongful detention or the loss of a child in battle or perhaps some unrelated injustice. If that which is being apologized for is not made explicit, the suggestion of torture is implicit in the poem's framing and its site of arrival in Guantanamo. The promise of a similar compensation offered to the speaker shimmers between the gaps, says they'll send me a check for I would. Never. The spacing of the poem thus illustrates an obstinate secrecy that heightens the unspeakable acts for which the neighbors are recompensed. In the context of the letter's destination and recipient, a Muslim husband imprisoned, Salim in Arabic means safe or intact, the white spaces also stand as a noticeably negative replacement for the black bars of redaction. The measurable intervals of the white page invite, to some extent, an imaginative populating, something like the gesture Salman Rushdie undertakes when he peoples and deities the Kaaba, renders it black with touch rather than in essence. The reader cannot help but fill in the gaps, suggest words in order to bring sense to the letter. At the same time, however, Sharif's choice of blankness in place of the obscuring mark reorients our relationship to the referent. In contrast to the aesthetics of secrecy and withholding, it suggests there may be no inside text, no truth to be unveiled, no subject to bring to light. She says in an interview that she in fact did not write words and then delete them. This is not, as we will see in the final letter of the series, a claim to the unknowability of the Muslim subject or of the impossibility of the literary as a vessel for the creation thereof. It functions more, I think, as a lament for the conditions of erasure under which such a subject is barred from coming into being or remaining present to the world or existing in time as a worlded object or subject. The seventh letter reads, Dear Salim, I read some Hikmat, human country. The wife sends letters to her like I do. I don't read now. He was like you. I've the books, all of them, can't stomach their. All those spines lined up on my shelf, how you would stand there smelling the pages. Them, they all say the same story and none tell ours. 
In refusing an aesthetics of concealment, Sharif's blank redactions in the poem Reaching Guantanamo displace long-standing hermeneutics, as I've said, of the Muslim subject and the black sites of the US torture machine that makes its way to us through the epidemiological lens in the form of the cholera morbidity maps of the 19th century London, the smallpox charts of the Algerian Revolution, and most recently, the Senate Intelligence Committee report on torture, which in spite of the visual confession of its own instability and incompleteness as a document, retains both its faith in the discoverable truth of the archive as well as its links to an oriental gothic legacy of unspeakable inhuman enmity. Sharif's is a challenge to the overwhelming consistency of a displacing of the oriental other through the dialectic of legible illegibility. As I have shown, I think, the consequences of this way of reading Islam and the Muslim subject, an epistemological tradition brought into being by the demands of ruling a multi-confessional colonial populace, largely in India, but also in the Middle East and North Africa, can be seen in the infinitely expanding parameters of the war on terror as a revival of the therapeutic empire. I'm going to share with you two poems to close. The first is Leanne Simpson's recent, from Leanne Simpson's recent collection, This Accident of Being Lost. And the poem is called Under Your Always Light. And it anticipates some of what I'm going to end with today. So listen, if you'd like, for the fugitive animal, the infection of something precious. Under your always light. After they stole you and you fought your way out, no one was going to fuck with you ever again. Get your own gun. Set your own net. Shoot your own moose. Get two husbands and a wife and make them all feel insane with good love. Give birth to a nation in an inglorious way, crawling through feces and urine and dirt and the bloody underbelly of betrayal. She says, use scar weapons to hold the land around them. Infect tiny bodies with the precious things they beat out of you. Remember, they are everything we could have been. Quesens falls asleep cradling the body of a duck while he weaves stories from bobcats and chickens and luck. Maybe Quesens steady slices through white fish while Guiwizens finally speaks. They all aim and fire. Standing up straight against this rock, I catch your fugitive eyes. Before I turn and lay my head down, I'm thinking of her escaping through these spruce, walking across these rocks, walking over this moss. I'm thinking of her escaping past stolen, walking across lost, walking over shame, holding fire in her heart like all her descendants so effortlessly do under your always light. So I'll end with a return to other nonviolent, anti-oppressive, non-appropriative forms of vulnerability and intersubjection, gay concerns, if you will, that both pick up on the capillary in Foucault and insist on the plenitude of the blank space, or in this case, the nugatory, a term I'm borrowing from composite knot theory to suggest something like redaction without a behind or reducibility without reduction. There are also brown behinds and flushed capillaries here. There is 9-11 as well, as there necessarily must be in any love poem written by an American Muslim. The paintings I'll talk about are Pakistani painter Shazia Sikandar's miniatures, particularly the ones painted in the years after 9-11, which pick up on the militarized iconography one sees, for example, in Afghan war rugs. So the habitual themes of classic per classical Persian miniature, like royalty, domesticated quadrupeds, birds, botanical luxury, cut through here with drones, surveillance towers, guns, boots, and armored vehicles. Slide, please. The hotel I talk about, the repurposed TWA terminal at New York's Kennedy Airport, is a nostalgic arc, a place many of us partied at in the early 2000s at the beginning of the war. Slide, please. Now an ode to the swooping lines of Saarinen. Slide, please. And the future of unimpeded travel for whom is a question the body must ask when entering this space that those lines imagined. Slide, please. 9-11 poem. She's nervous at the museum, late, and I've said hi to the director. Ask the guard if I can take no-flash photos. I reach for her hand to show her a horse, she says in pencil, and then keeps calling out the things she sees, as if I don't also see them. It's a gazelle, look, the twisting horns. I don't know animals, she says. I think, correct. On 9-11, hours from kissing at the door, I in my undies, skateboard under her arm, I text to say, let's read in the park, but instead I watch the sky, watch how she reads my book with a pen. At the museum, she says, I always get yelled at by the guards, but why are you touching the art? It isn't that they watch and I get too close. She points out a tower, two towers, she says, in a miniature. There's five towers, I say, and two bombers. In the new hotel at the terminal, we lock in a day with no flight, the particulars of how we detonate and at what speed, the actual costly mood of the sky, the actual moonlight on waves, the sacrifice of another pair of undies to the tide, which is so strong we don't have to lift our feet to get knocked around. 
When I see crisis coming, she says, disaster, yes, like a terrorist cell, you mean, like very effective, yes. And then, like very effective, yes. I spot birds in paintings and in life, and she says, you could have been a pilot, so hot, and then, I want you on my face. Everyone in the Northern Hemisphere with melanin is at their most beautiful in September. We send jellyfish back out to the void. We fathom what we really think about drones, when we were arrested or surveilled. I like it that I can't tell whose legs are whose in this nugatory crossing. She says, that's the gayest thing you've ever said, and I say, yes, yes, fine. Reach your gorgeous mama hand into my throat. Stop me from speaking. Stop me from praying. Thank you, that's it from me. I just realized my pen is in my hair. Well, it's perfect. Okay, we're getting it. Um, well, uh, many thanks because it was uh, absolutely incredible. Uh, and I think that uh, we all uh, were craving for some words, actually, Good. Uh, to be speaking in, in a different way. And precisely, I would like to, to start uh, asking you about uh, words. You were talking about uh, how um, at some point uh, words were not enough to describe uh, certain situations, to talk about uh, very specific uh, politics elements. And what you were claiming, for example, even with uh, Fred Motten, uh, how there is a normative way of talking, of writing, and that the words should be in a very precise uh, way. And every time that you have just, that you are trying to play with how the words could be placed in a very specific, even in the page, suddenly there is a, a political capacity mm. in that. And I think that it was very clear, uh, not only the redacted, um, the redacted documents uh, that you were showing, that then suddenly they were uh, uh, showing visually how words and politics are interconnected, but also in the embodiment of those words when you were making, for example, these silences, uh, when you were uh, actually uh, having like certain kind of voids between uh, words in certain sentences. And I think that my question would be, is there a queer art of speaking, of wording and rewarding, let's say, to talk precisely about vulnerabilities, to talk about other political issues that doesn't represent a lot of other people? I love this question. Um, I, I'll answer it sort of anecdotally, and then I'll try to be a little bit serious. So, when so is there a queer way of speaking or of writing? I um, it feels important to say that my also gay brother talks exactly like I do, and no one knows why we speak like such idiots. Like, there, I mean, everybody thinks we're from California. We are not. I don't know why we talk this way. We just do talk this way. Um, and it is a source of great hilarity to many. You know my brother. You know that this is true. Um, so I think, like, yeah, like I think, of course, there's a queer way of speaking. And it is about, I think, disrupting the sort of habitus of power. Um, the, the bodily habits of a, of a kind of, um, I mean, I also inhabit the academy, so the bodily habits of like, you know, patriarchy and patriarchal teaching. As far as writing is concerned, I mean, I've spent more time thinking about spiralistic and relational writing coming from a post-colonial lens. I, th I think that queer writing is like necessarily in relation with Glissant's poetics of relation. I think it's necessarily in relation with spiralism, with creolization. Um, and, I, and maybe I'll just end by saying, and you can ask me more if you want to hear more about this, but like there are also figures and forms that are hella gay. Like a crisis is really gay. It means a telling out. It is a coming out kind of gesture. What we do in ekphrastic work is we bring something that's two-dimensional or three-dimensional into a time-based medium. Um, and once it's in that time-based medium, we've like queered it or transformed it in a certain kind of way. Um, I also think metonymy is very queer. Um, and the habit of nicknaming and a kind of chain of signification where there isn't, I mean, you heard me talk a lot about this today, but like a lot of what I'm trying to figure out in this book and in my own work in general is like, 
what is the fascism of the vertical relationship between the referent and the sign, and what does it mean to work in figure that moves horizontally? So if epidemiology is interested in those things that spread horizontally rather than the kind of etiological um, plunging that a book like, that like, just think of the image in The Birth of the Clinic where Foucault talks about the kind of pre-epidemiological mode of medical knowledge making is like opening the brain and like literally, like it's like this, it's literal pathology. You open the body to find the thing that is disrupted in it. Epidemiology is like not the body, the social body, right? So those horizontalities that literally work via contagion and touching together seem to me to be the space for where queer signification and, and writing can happen. Yeah, I absolutely agree also. Uh, in that sense, um, I think that it's interesting that we were discussing uh, yesterday and also today about uh, this uh, position of, apparent position of neutrality that is very much based also on this uh, idea of scientific knowledge that is mostly coming from certain kind of Western traditions. But even within that, there are other voices and there are other ways actually of discussing how it is actually fully charged with politics, ideologies, and also knowledge structures. And something that it is trying, for example, to detach any kind of emotion, any kind of sensitivities that suddenly are not canonical, that are not normative, right. because they are exaggerated, because they are unexpected, because they are non-normative. Right. And I think that uh, it was very much also in, in your in your poems, or the poems also, that you were uh, uh, reading out loud, that then suddenly there were like this kind of U-turns in a way that is like uh, suddenly there is an exaggeration, there is a stop, there is something that it is actually disturbing this kind of, let's say, poise or uh, let's say narration that is supposed to be objective, neutral, but it is uh, care, uh, that is taking care actually of uh, other emotions, other sensitivities that are highly political in that uh, sense. Yeah, I, I mean, man, I have, I have so much to say about this, but I, I think what I'll land on is that um, last week I had my graduate students writing curses um, to think about like speech act theory and what happens when language becomes material. And we started the semester with Liberté ou Mort, which is the Haitian Declaration of Independence. Like how does language bring a new nation into being, for example? Um, this is J.L. Austin stuff, but it's also, it's politics, like to, to declare oneself independent. So their homework was to not share with me sexting like each other or whoever they sext in general. Like how do we make a thing happen in a body with text? Um, and I think that when we do that in collective space or on the page that could be distributed who knows where, I mean, literally we're doing that. We're like making a, we're making a, shared, exp a shared physical experience, whether that's the goosebumps that you get on your arms from hearing somebody's beautiful voice or like something that happens, some astonishment that happens or a gasp. I had a friend once describe to me reading um, Leanne Simpson, the poem, uh, the poet who I read, uh, as being like watching basketball for her, where she like finds herself like like mimicking what's happening on the you know like her, the page is making her move, and I think I don't know if I'm getting at the thing that you were talking about, but I but when we th oh I lost my mic pack when we think about um, like language having that kind of political impact, I think it has to start with the body, like it has to be felt first. I mean this is why also protest is important to me because it's like rhythm in the feet and it's. Um, chants that are made up on the spot. I mean, that's live poetry that's happening in space, watching those, like, yeah, like evolve and play telephone between 5th and 33rd and 5th and 23rd. Yeah, I, I, I was, uh, while I was uh, listening to you, I was precisely thinking that uh, recently um, in... Um, uh, talking with uh, Cecilia Vicuña, the, the amazing artist, uh, she was saying, uh, we don't talk enough about menopause and about oh, menstruation. I love talking about menopause. Exactly. And she was like, uh, uh, we don't uh, hear about uh, menopause in the media, we don't hear about uh, menopause uh, in the government, so maybe we should sing about menopause or maybe we should dance about uh, menopause and menstruation because uh, uh, if we are not going to talk about, at least we are going to dance about uh, menopause. And with that, uh, with that uh, I was thinking precisely in the 
sounds and noises, not only that you were showing about, of course, uh, Guantanamo at the, at the beginning, but also even like in the, in the poem at the beginning of the, it's amazing, it's amazing. And I was thinking precisely how uh, last year, at the very beginning of uh, COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, I think that it was in April, actually, like a month uh, later, it really arrived in the United States. Uh, the New York Public Library suddenly uh, was trying to take care of New Yorkers in a very specific mm. way. And they were saying, we have such a kind of overload of images. We are stuck to our screens because we are suddenly have all of these uh, Zoom meetings, uh, not only with work uh, with, uh, you know, like with uh, uh, labor uh, practices, but also with our relatives, etc. And they said, and, and I think that what we are really missing actually are noises and the noises that are completely surrounding us. And then they released a series of noises that they kept in the New York Public Library that every New Yorker like to say that they hate like the subway, like for example, when you are in <laughs> a queue. fucking ice cream truck. <laughs> or the supermarket. But everything, but suddenly it was extremely moving that everybody was like really missing something that yeah. it was not visual immediately, but that it was coming also like from other senses. And also what could be like the capacity of change also in other noises, just like uh, you were showing. Mm, yeah. You agree? Yeah, I mean, I sound is so nostalgic for this reason because it is also lit, like l literally physical um, in that the, in that like vibration uh, and and anyway I don't need to go on about this I'm not an uh, acoustic specialist but yes I mean it gets in you in a different kind of way um, Megan, I can't remember the name of your essay that is very much about walking and sounds this is Megan Fernandez she has a gorgeous essay that she published in lit hub last year that is called Elemental City, I really recommend it. Also, I want to, to open the floor to, to questions or interventions, or just like to say to, to Julie that it was uh, wonderful, of course. <laughs> Thanks everybody for sitting through this. I know it's been a long day. Please don't feel like you have to ask questions. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I want to ask about the idea of New York in your work, especially in the first poem, the amazing poem. And I was thinking, I lived in New York, I went to grad school there, so I lived there for two years. So I, some of the, um, the places and the sounds and the feelings were familiar to me, of mm -hmm. course. And they're familiar to many people because, you know, media, literature, cinema. How do you feel how much of your work going forward, uh, and I see that you're based in Toronto. Are you based in Toronto, physically? No, I, I still live in New York. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, like all of cute. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because Toronto does have that quality of, it's, it's, a non, it's almost a non-iconical city. And I was thinking about how, how do you deteriorate, deteri deteri how do you take that, your work or your thinking from territory, mm, right. in specifically to New York? Yeah, um, thanks. Thanks so much for that question, and also like, and also just for the observation that stands behind it. I, you know, it's it's hard for anyone. It would be hard, I think, for anyone to see without the preface of Epidemic Empire, which is just a pretty standard scholarly monograph. But, like that's also a New York book. <laughs> like I was in I was in the city. I was I was 19 when 9/11 happened, um, and so, and I and I was born upstate and was obsessed with the license plate and there was a stream that was a tributary to the Hudson River in my backyard and I was constantly threatening to run away to get a pastrami sandwich and I built this raft and I would like go on the raft and then I would try to go to the Hudson River and then sail. So I think, I mean there's no, there's no getting away from the empire state, which is what it is called, um, but that is also so embedded in my thinking. I mean I, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's wrong to say that my interest in empire studies was partly because I was fascinated with that word as a kid on the license plate of the New York State cars. Um, it's where my parents met, uh, my mom is from Pakistan, my dad grew up outside of Chiktawaga in Buffalo, um, and I think that I think that for any diasporic family, especially one that's been multiply displaced, so my people are Mahajars, which means that my family is from what is now India, and 
moved on August 14th, 1947, on the trains. My grandfather helped to set up the government in Pakistan. And my mother was born there, but her parents and older siblings were not. Um, the anchor in place, like, it's already a deterritorialized experience. Um, and so I'm, I'm sort of unabashedly nostalgic and sentimental and attached to, like, my literal apartment. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, I think all the work, in a way, is about New York. It's where I've lived since I was 17. Um, I mean, the city is where I've lived since I was 17, and it's also where I was born and raised. It's annoying, in a way, to be a person who writes about New York. Um, I apologize. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, and Julie, it has been a, a long day, but I think that uh, it was really incredible. And I think that, uh, really, again, uh, we could not wish for any better, let's say, closure of uh, this day, because uh, we started uh, precisely talking about mosquitoes. We were also talking about other kind of uh, mosquitoes, and precisely the, the political power, not only of words, but embodying uh, those words in very specific uh, ways, not in metaphorical terms, but mm. in very material, realistic, rheumatistic uh, ways, and the way that also that it could shape our world, but also other possibilities and other alternatives and other archipelagos of, uh, let's say, activism in that sense. You know what? I'm so, I feel so silly for not saying this earlier, but in case anybody cared about that question and really wants to think about it, I can't believe I forgot to say, like, part of the thing about words in becoming politicized in public space was also the experience of, like, suddenly Urdu being a threatening thing to speak in public. And if one, if one were to pray, this is partly what the end of that last poem is about, mm -hmm. that for me to pray in public after 9-11 was like a catastrophe. <laughs> like, if you say Allahu Akbar, like, you're fucked. Yeah. Um, so this kind of like rapid criminalization of speech, this rapid change of meaning um, was, yeah, I just think about it all the time when I think about, um, yeah, words and politics. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. So again, uh, please join me to, to, to uh, thank uh, uh, Anjuli for this fantastic talk. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow.